Ng Meetup for No Name Books. My name is Shakira, and I am going to be your facilitator for the evening. As you all know, we had the opportunity to meet up and collaborate with three other really great Black women-driven, women-centered uh, book clubs and organizations. So first, let's shout out to the Claudia Jones School of Education. They could not make it this evening, but we are so, so happy that they decided to say yes to be partners. Uh, shout out to y'all on the amazing work that you do on a regular basis. Um, we are also super welcome and super excited to welcome Anna Malekata, who is the author of Three Mothers, a book that all hey. three of us have collect collectively agreed that we could not put down. An amazing story about three amazing women who sometimes seem to get pushed to the background because of who their sons were. Um, and we also have Miss Glory from the Well Read Black Girl Book Club organization, just an amazing organization overall. And of course, we have our girl Jamie Swift, my also Ken Philly join, you know what I'm saying? Good to see you, Jamie, from Black Women Radicals. Um, it's going to be a good conversation. We've been getting it warmed up for you all so i think it's gonna be Even it's gonna be live so, so happy so uh i will let each of these wonderful ladies introduce themselves and we will start with anna hi everyone i am so excited to be here i was saying to everybody beforehand that this is just an honor for me i'm such a big fan of all of these orgs and when you all chose my book i started i like yelled i was so excited and i really felt seen and recognized i appreciate you so much for supporting me and for the love and i'm just looking forward to tonight um as you said my name is anna malika tubbs i'm the author of the three mothers how the mothers of martin luther king jr malcolm x and james baldwin shaped a nation and indeed they did and if you haven't read the book yet we'll talk all about how they did that tonight and i am also a mother to a 17 month old ball of energy he is wonderful and amazing and i'm also pregnant so i have a baby coming in august which i'm very excited about and we just moved to los angeles so that'll be my fun fact we are in the middle of settling into our new house and um otherwise you know like life wasn't crazy enough we're also in the middle of that transition but again thank you and i'm excited just excited to be here Woo! <laughs> um next we will have uh glory introduce herself all right hi everyone my name is glory adam i'm the founder of well red black girl which is a literary organization and festival that celebrates the work of Black women, girls, and non-binary folks. Um, we, uh, this year, 2021, is our five-year anniversary, so it's a really big deal for us. Thank you, thank you. Um, we have read almost over 100 books over the five years, and we've had so many incredible people be part of our community, and we're so happy to be part of this collective um, because we express, we, I, I was going to say express, but I want to say respect. Uh, everyone in this organization, from No Name to uh, Radical Women uh, to Claudia Jones, everyone, Anna, like this is the collective group that we really admire and want to be hold hands with always. So this book was dear to me because of the three women here. Um, and also I'm a new mom. My son is turning one tomorrow. Um, and so I couldn't help but just think about his legacy and the things that I will pass down to him. And there were so many just beautiful gems of history and the meaning of lineage really like fits in the pages of this book. So thank you, Anna, for writing it. Um, and thank you, No Name, for like bringing this all together. This is dope and it's Women's History Month, so it's, it's perfect. All right, and thank you again for joining us. And last we have my, my Joan and Ken right there, Jamie. Let the people know. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Jamie Swift. I use she, her pronouns. I'm the executive director and creator of Black More Radicals, which is a Black feminist advocacy organization. And we're dedicated to uplifting Black women and gender expansive people's radical activism in Africa and the African diaspora. I'm super excited to be here with you, Anna, with Glory, with No Name Books. Like, Thank you for all the collective work that you all do. And also just like this book, is a, like, you know, 
what Black Mirror Radicals tries to discuss, right? Like overcoming the erasure of Black women and gender expansive people from around the world, right? And I think that's so important because we cannot repeat white supremacist, capitalist, cis heteronormative uh, revisionist histories, right? And so your book offers a fuller contextualization of the lives of uh, El Haj, Malik Al Shabazz, Malcolm X, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., and James Baldwin. So thank you so much. Yay! And we also want to give a, an amazing shout out to the author of How We Get Free. I have the digital copy of how we get free I don't have the physical copy um so you won't be able to see it on my screen I have that pulled up over here as well but we want to thank Kiang and Yamada Taylor for um also providing us with a wonderful piece of text right for doing the work that was necessary to sit down with the elders right and ask these very hard questions and really get into what it means um to be a black woman and to have the and how to how to define your identity politics, right? Because we say the words a lot, but we don't necessarily always know exactly what we mean when we say it. So thank you for the work, Kianya. Thank you. Um, and we wish you could have been here. So let's get like right into the book, right? Um, I believe we have a set of questions. Um, Glory, you want to go first? Yeah, I can. Um, I mean, We've all said how much this book has nurtured us. And I think I just want to start at the very beginning of your origin story. What led you to, to select these three women in particular? And what inspired you to just build this beautiful narrative around their lives? Oh, goodness. You know, it's it's a, it should be an easy answer, but I always have to try to make it more succinct because as we all know, so many experiences go into this moment, you know, whenever you get your work out there and what really inspired it. So <clears throat> I'll take it all the way back to my mom. Um, she's always been somebody who really taught me that women and mothers matter, that our identity matters, that, you know, we always have to think about the ways in which women are being mistreated. She would often say in all of the places where we grew up, because we moved around a lot because of her job, as well as my father's job. And they taught at different universities abroad. And my mom advocated for women and children's rights abroad. And so she would say everywhere we went, she would say, uh, the best, if women are doing well in a community, that community will do well. So that's how you can judge how a society is doing. Are they supporting women? Are they giving women the supports and protections that they need? Um, so this was always her general mentality on things. And so when I kind of grew up and formed my own opinions and kind of understood my own identity better, I started to also have a deeper understanding of intersectionality and how womanhood altogether was not always the same and how we needed to think about the different ways in which we each walked through life. And I, I really, really developed that when I was an undergrad. And so I said, I want to study this more, went to get my master's in gender studies. And then I just knew that I wanted to be someone who contributed to correcting the erasure of our stories, of Black women's stories. And I loved Margot Lee Shetterly's Hidden Figures. Um, and if you haven't read the book, of course, the film you've probably heard of. Um, but the way in which she not only changed our understanding of American history, but our understanding of where we are as a nation today. And I left, you know, reading that book feeling very frustrated, um, similar to how I hope many people feel when they read my book. You feel both inspired, but also frustrated and shocked that we didn't already know these stories because. It wasn't a mistake, for instance, in Hidden Figures that we weren't aware that Black women were behind the numbers in calculating the space launch. That's not like a, oops, we forgot to tell you. <laughs> That's This doesn't fit our vision as a nation of who the leaders are and who the heroes of the story are. And therefore, we're going to not only keep it from the light, but also hide it very intentionally. And so I said, I'm gonna be somebody who continues to tell more stories of hidden figures. And that obviously left this really wide landscape. So many of our stories are forgotten, erased, not given the credit or the recognition that they deserve. So I thought, how many different layers of erasure can I address with one project? How many different things can I blow up in that way? And so, of course, the civil rights movement came to mind. It's such an important moment in history that we come back to over and over and over again, and we'll continue to do so for years to come when we're talking about policy, when we're talking about so many different things, we come back to the civil rights movement. But unfortunately, many people can name way more male leaders than anybody else in the civil rights movement. It's so, so male and very heteronormative. And so I thought, 
I'm going to do something to address the civil rights movement, but in a unique way. Then I thought about roles in our society that are, again, overlooked, underappreciated, unrecognized. And because of the way in which my mom always spoke about mothers, motherhood came to my mind immediately. And I thought, gosh, has no one done this work yet? Has no one done this project before? So when I started to look into that and realized this might be the first that is of, of its kind, I was one, again, very shocked, upset about that, but consoled by the fact that I was going to tell that story. And again, there were lots of options. I thought, okay, how do I do this? How do I balance the fact that I'm not trying to only celebrate the men of the movement by any means, but I also know that this will be kind of a trick for people who think, oh, I'm going to get to know about the three men if that's their motivation. And then they'll leave with a reminder of who the real, um, who the real leaders of the story are and who we really need to be celebrating and uplifting. And so I said, okay, I'm going to do this on the mothers of three sons in the civil rights movement, um, because I don't think that the mothers of other children are any more or less erased. I think mothers generally are not appreciated and not celebrated enough. But I also think that something happens in a society that relies so much on a gender binary, where you can really blow somebody's mind <laughs> when you say, look at these three men who you value so dearly, who we talk about every single year. Actually, they were formed by a Black woman. Not only were they formed in her body, but beyond her identity before she became a mother, her passions, her activism, what she was dedicated to and carried forward into her motherhood is what led these men down their path. So I could make a very clear statement about the gender binary and challenging that where we are so often assuming men influence boys, et cetera. So that's why I decided. And finally, these three women, because they were all born within six years of each other, and then their famous sons were all born within five years of each other. And when I found that fact, I thought, wow, that is going to be a really cool talk around American history and how we can see a century of our country, but through their eyes. Definitely. Thank you so much for sharing that. I'm sorry, were you supposed to no, okay. I was, was going to say, like, yes. Yes, I was about to say, I'm, I'm ready. I'm so sorry. I don't want to be rude. I respect, you know, uh, that I'm a guest. But um, thank you so much for answering that amazing question, Glory, um, that you posed. I love the fact that you uh, center the quotidian, like the everyday um, Black women, because a lot of times that goes overlooked. My question is also very, very like academic in the sense that you are a PhD candidate at Cambridge in sociology. And as someone who uh, just finished up my PhD, it's interesting how <laughs> it's a mess. And we'll talk about that later. Oh, um, it's a mess. So I was trying to like set me free. Anyway, you know, as someone who <laughs> uh, is in academia, quote unquote, a lot of times uh, we're expected to have this very objective positionality that we're not supposed to uh, be subjective. And you really talk about how um, this book was at times difficult for you to write, um, knowing like the trauma and the history. And so how do you, how did you um, separate yourself from trying to uh, fit into this like ivory tower um, uh, notion that you have to have this very objective perspective and not really engage and even feel and, and, and uh, align yourself personally as well as politically with your work? That's such a good question. And I always describe myself as an academic who like hates academia. <laughs> I have always hated how exclusive it is, how it's so much of a performance, like all this academic jargon for no reason. And I, I say this even in talks that I give, you know, in academic settings, a lot of, I say the audiences, a lot of what you're saying, no one understands. And I don't see <laughs> the point of not being understood, especially when I work on Black feminist work, and I, I base all of my work in Black feminist theory, this was not meant for the academy, and I find it to be a crime that it's been stolen in that way, and then just used to study us um, and not allow us to really apply it to our survival, which is what it's intended for. And so I'm really political in that way. I've always gotten into arguments with my advisors about this, but usually I will say by the end, they're on my side and I do the parts that I need to do to pass and you know do well in my program. So I'm not gonna lie, that also has mattered to me. I want to get the degrees because 
I'm aware that we're so disrespected as black women as it is. I want to get my, you know, these words out there. I want more people to celebrate us and help us and it, us be not only admired, but action be taken and people understand how policy really. So I get that in order for me to, I think, in my own opinion, do that um, and have to deal with less disrespect it's helpful to have a PhD. So I've always been aware of that goal um, and was going to succeed in that, but I wasn't willing to give up parts of myself in order to achieve that. So I was intentional about who I chose as advisors and in Cambridge, they call them supervisors. I've always had women of color on my side um, who I tell them at the beginning, this is what this project is going to be. It's going to look a little different. It's going to be very readable. You may not like that, but I'm not going to use words that are big just to do so. I'm also not going to quote Marx or Weber or these old white men who have nothing to do with Black women's stories. And I'm going to show you some, some other scholars and maybe non-scholars who are were never in academia but are so much more well versed in these issues and that we should introduce to academics because there's so much that they could gain from them. And I've been really fortunate that I've found support in doing that. I've had some committee members though, like even in what in my dissertation, um, when I was passing my what's called a viva in Cambridge, it's your oral defense. Someone asked me, is this something like, they don't think it would have been acceptable <laughs> in their department, basically. Um, and the dissertation is really different than the book. I will say there, there is an academic theory that I'm developing in the dissertation that I leave out of the book entirely. So again, like I said, I play the game, um, but only to a certain extent. And she, she did say, you know, I actually think you've taken a huge risk here. And I said, I'm doing this on purpose because hopefully when other students come after me, because again, Cambridge is hella white. It's not, you know, I mean, my undergrad was also very white, but Cambridge is a whole other world of lack of recognition around racial injustice or just generally race. Um, and so I knew I was taking that risk. And she said, you know, I, I congratulate you for that because this will change the department. The fact that you're, you're, you've passed your viva with a dissertation that is really not very academic in that sense will help us to accept other students who want to do it in this way. So that's the balance that I've always tried to reach. Um, but I knew even when I started my PhD that I wanted the book to be a trade book. I wasn't going to publish it with an academic press. This was for the masses. This is for audience members. This is inclusive. It's readable. It's approachable. And then in terms of how I addressed, you know, the parts that were really difficult to write, um, it was, I mean, it's just, it's part of studying our lives and telling Black women's stories, but it's also the complexity of who we are. It's not just pain. It's not just grief. Don't see us as these kind of, you know, weird superhumans who can tolerate more pain than anybody else. It was a moment to remind myself that that is what I was writing about, the complexity and the difficulty, but also the ways in which we found joy and created life and claimed our humanity, no matter how many times others have tried to take that from us. And so in those moments where even it was hard to write, especially when I was pregnant, it was really difficult because I knew that the kind of climactic moment of the book is something we all know is coming is that they lose their sons like this the fear that they have becomes real there's definitely moments where I have to say they also taught me that that's not something I just need to accept it's not an inevitable burden they carried lessons with to us saying this is hopeful our lives are worth fighting for our lives are worth celebrating and love and fun and light are also a huge part of our journey and so I really held on to those moments while acknowledging the real fears and difficulties of being a Black mother. I would love to uh, follow up and, and tie in um, a piece of the Kambahi Rivers uh, collective statement here um, to what we believe. And I'll read it for those of us who don't have the book in front of us. Um, Above all else, our politics initially sprang from the shared belief that Black women are inherently valuable, that our liberation is a necessity, not just as an adjunct to somebody else's, but because of our need as human persons for autonomy. Important. 
This may seem so obvious as to sound simplistic, but it is apparent that no other ostentatiously progressive movement has ever considered our specific oppression as priority or worked seriously for the ending of that oppression. Merely naming the pejorative stereotypes attributed to Black women, for example, mammy, matriarch, sapphire, whore, bull dagger. If you don't know what a bull dagger is, people, ask your old granny. If she is from the South, she has used the word, unfortunately, I guarantee you. Let alone cataloging the cruel, often murderous treatment we receive indicates how little value has been placed upon our lives during four centuries of bondage in the Western Hemisphere, we realize that only people who care enough about us to work consistently for our liberation are us. I think everything that you just said, Anna, is in that, is literally that paragraph, right? The only, which is why you, you state you did the pushback for making sure that the language was accessible, right? For why you decided to focus on these three women, right? I am not an academic. I tried and failed. I, would, I tell people I'm a college dropout proudly all of the time. Um, and part of the reason I realized I did not fit is because me being a animated uh boisterous loud black woman did not fit and I refused at one point in my life to be put in a box just so other people could be comfortable and I think what these women are saying here and what these women in this book did was say you can't put us there as badly as you want to we refuse it at every juncture and we're going to pass the resistance on to our offspring right I think that's such a powerful thing. Um, I think that's such a powerful thing to do and such a powerful thing that we can continue doing, right? Like even the fact that the, all of us gathered to pick these very radical books for the sake of Black women because Women History Month often does get put in the white lens, you know, um, to lift up the names of these very radical women um, and their work, not only these three, again, these three mothers, but the collective work of the Kambahi River Collective and two women authors, hello. Um, you know, it's just, in, it's just important to continue um, that work in this tradition, because again, we won't get to get free until we free ourselves. <laughs> Jamie, I can't hear you. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I, mean, I need uh, you to look at the chat. I need you to look at the chat. And Jamie wrote it. You don't need a degree <laughs> to be a scholar. You are yeah. brilliant. And you oh, are thank you, lady. So like, yes. cut that out. <laughs> you, you are good. <laughs> no, but I, but I often think that like women who look like me, who act like me, who come from city, majority black cities like me, we get told that we have to perform in a certain way. And when you don't perform in a certain way, you are automatically less than, right? Because I ain't got a degree, because I didn't do this, because I didn't do that. And then I have to work three, four, five times harder um, because of that fact. But we often forget that a lot of the academic a lot of the reasons that we have the words for things is because of the everyday woman, right? We overlook that experience because they don't have that piece of paper. And that's not to discredit anybody who's done the work of getting a PhD because I have a friend in a program right now and it is very hard. He's, I, I love him to death, but he is going through it. And I don't discredit any of the work that's ever been done by anybody on that level. But I do think sometimes we put the, the, the extra onus on on the fact that you got to go do this thing you know um and so I, I do sorry, I'm sorry can I just say one thing and I'll let Glory I, I know you probably have a question but what you're saying and what Anna was also uh, speaking about I think about in the book how Louise Little would um when her children would come home and they were like what she was like what did you learn today and she was like oh no this white person said this to you I'm like we're going to reteach you <laughs> like what the like this is not right I'm going to undo this like white revisionist history I'm going to te like teach you about yourself I'm going to instill pride and that is like what everyday black mothers parents you know do I mean I remember as a kid um I grew up in a predominantly white area and my grandmom had these uh Eb she still has them I have them now but the ebony encyclopedias I don't know if you remember them 
but I have them and she like my mom and my grandma would make me read them. And so that's how I had a better understanding. Like I didn't, my people didn't start from enslavement. <laughs> like, I, you know what I mean? We have a vast history. And so your point speaks to uh, what the three mothers, you know, did and what Anna was discussing in the book. Jamie, my, my granny had those two, not my granny. I think it was one of my aunts that had them and they used to come, used to tear the order form out the back of the jet or the Ebony magazine in order to, <laughs> um, I also just recently got the, the big black book from, um, uh, by, uh, Toni Morrison, that whole collective of history, never had it until I was an adult and could go get it. And it's one of those things that I tell every, every person, young or old, that they have to have in their library because it is a credible source to do that, that kind of, you know, searching and information that you don't always have to go to, to the white people's encyclopedia to, to get the information. Um, and that there are Black archivers out there who have done the work who will gladly share it with you too. So, definitely yes to all of those things yeah. um, I think my, my next question like we have touched on so many different points but Anna you said the word survival when you were answering that question and you just said the word archive and I'm thinking about everything that's happening now in this current political moment like I, I, I can't bring myself to watch the trial right now but it definitely has been on my heart and I've been thinking so much about what is happening right right now and how do you see your book intersecting with the current political landscape and also influencing organizing because I definitely felt this urge of like so many of the chapters felt like a call to action. Like I was thinking like, what do I do next with this information and how do I prevent other mothers uh, and just our people from being further erased in history and at this current moment? Yeah, absolutely. It was, for me, I mean, especially the concluding chapter for those like, if, you know, I think throughout the book, I'm trying to say this is a call to action, here are things, but for anybody who misses that, and I would say it's probably more so people who are not Black women who are gonna miss that feeling that you felt of like, oh, there's a call to action at the end of this chapter. The final one, the conclusion, I'm like, I will like hit you <laughs> over the head with it. I call it my Black feminist manifesto for where we are as a nation today. Don't just admire these three women. Don't just sit here and say, look how strong they were. Look how resilient these Black women were. And that's, we hear that over and over and over again. Um, and it's actually one of the reasons that throughout the book, I also mentioned contemporaries, their contemporaries who were killed or something happened to them and they quote unquote didn't survive. It wasn't because they didn't have a fight. It wasn't because they weren't resilient. It's because these attacks against us were life or death. It, there's, you know, there wasn't other choices for us in that way. Um, so instead of this continuous congratulations for wow, you made it through this really traumatic thing that this nation did to you. Um, now let's think about why there are so many fears that are similar that I feel as a black mother that Alberta Burtis and Louise felt for themselves, for their children. Why is that still present in the United States today and beyond? I mean, it's a global, you know, anti-racist, anti-sexist treatment. Um, but I think specifically in the United States where this obvious relationship, especially with motherhood and us being the only ones who were legally deemed the givers of non-life, the givers of property that in law, our children, as soon as they were born, were not ours, but were white people's property. Um, I think about all the many things that still need to change. And I think there's an opportunity when you tell a story through history and through the eyes of three women where people get to know them personally and you maybe fall in love with them and you're really like connected to their story to now think about placing them at the center of policy and what are we trying to change? And I think, of course, it's different the action that I'm trying to inspire depending on who is holding that book and who is picking it up. For Black women, I'm not trying to say we need to do any more work. I'm saying I want us to feel seen, celebrated, recognized in this book and all of our complexities and all of our nuances and all the many ways where I'm trying to fight how our, our lives are reduced. And so for me, it's not necessarily a call to action to Black women. I think we're doing more and beyond what we need to do. But for everybody else, all the different ways and we're which people are continuously trying to victimize us, whether we're able to conquer that or not, it needs to stop, whether it's domestic violence, whether that's killing our Black trans sisters, well, whether that's thinking of mass incarceration, the fact that Black women are being forced to give so much of our money to a system that incarcerates our loved ones, whether that's, you know, ending a cash bail system, 
Um, there's so much more that I even wanted to add, you know, this release of, of people in the middle of the night. This is another thing that has been terribly dangerous, especially for Black women, um, that further says you, we don't care about you. You finally, like, are, you've gained your freedom. You're, we're finally letting you go, and we're leaving you to go wander the streets in the middle of the night. Um, I think about the fact that gun violence, that there still is not something in place to curb gun violence. Why are these laws still so lenient? Of course, there is the, the obvious in terms of police violence, um, but it also relates to the Black maternal health crisis. And there's just so many ways in which we're being denied our humanity, in which we continue to fight against that and we continue to know our value and our worth. But it's not on us to feel empowered, which is what so many people think is the solution. Oh, like Black women, like believe in yourselves more, like you're so, that's not the pro, like we, we have always believed in ourselves. We've always pushed this nation forward. We've always believed in something bigger than what we could readily see because we couldn't accept the ways in which we and our children were being treated. And that's why we've been able to continue to change the system. But at this point, the system needs to change and our country needs to take notice and other people need to say, what are things we can do to alleviate the burden that black women are very uniquely facing? Everybody should be disgusted and afraid and terrified that black women are four times more likely to die in pregnancy or in childbirth. That's a, that's awful. And it shouldn't be just us who know this. It shouldn't be just us who are fearful of this. It's not okay that black women feel so fearful for their children's lives real, very real, this, this logical fear, you know, for many other mothers, it's more that like, of course, you're, you're afraid of losing your child, everybody feels that. But for us, it's because there's direct attacks that are being waged against us. And so what I hope for this book is especially for audiences outside of black women to think, what can I do? And to really apply these three women's lives to why we're saying things like defund the police. Think about Burtis, think about how it could have helped her to have someone to call in this abusive relationship who wasn't a police officer, who is somebody who was trained. Let's think about how we support more black people who wanna become therapists. Right now, it's extremely difficult. One of my best friends is a therapist and she was telling me how you have to do all these hours unpaid. Well, then, of course, people of privilege are going to become our therapists when you have to do hundreds of hours of work that is completely unpaid. So there's just a lot of there's so much. The conclusion is filled with here are all the direct actions. It's actually very tangible. It's not this kind of like pie in the sky and maybe someday it could possibly happen. It's these are things we've been saying for a long time. And if you still don't understand why we're saying you know, certain, whether it's catchphrases or how we're leading our movements by really pushing some very specific issues to the forefront, just center these three women's lives and think about them today and what could have made their lives easier. And then imagine how much more revolutionary Black women could be if we're not also forced to carry this entire burden and weight on our shoulders alone. <laughs> Um, just to jump back to the statement, because I think I, I just I'm looking and, and thinking and um, point three of the statement. Um, if you have the book, it's on page 44, um, 44, 45. We do not. Uh, it states we do not have the racial, sexual, heterosexual or class privilege to rely on, nor do we have the minimal access, the minimal access to resources and power that groups who possess any one of these types of privilege have. I, I just, and that's point three of the, of the Compahee River Collective Statement. I mean, that's what you just said. Like women, black women don't have the same access. And I, and in my mind, I, be, I really be trying to figure out why y'all. I don't, can somebody give me the answer? Because as much work as that you've done in this book with these three women and Kanya has done editing the statement and talking to the elders, I worry, I worry about the fact that people always talk about support Black women, show up for Black women, and then nobody does it. And then nobody does it. So are we just supposed to do it ourselves all of the time? And I think one of the reasons for that is that we haven't, I mean, we've tried, but I think we're going to have to continue <laughs> trying to explain it in this very tangible 
policy, like things, these are things that need to change. Like we need to think about universal child care, universal basic income. Like it's not just come and help us because apparently other people aren't making the connections to our dehumanization and how this leads to death and how this leads to violence against black women. So if they're not making the connection and they're not thinking, okay, what can I do? Then I was, I really, when I was thinking about this conclusion, I was like, I just need to just make it very clear and obvious. Like, this is how we vote. This is why this matters. This is why it matters who's representing us. It matters, you know, to respect activists and those that are putting their lives on the line to march for all of us. Like, it's not, oh, we're so afraid of these people. Like. No, this is how change has happened because without that, nothing will change. So I think it's just making it even more obvious, but I don't know how we do that. I really don't know. We've tried it. We have tried it for years, but I think it's also a moment to celebrate. I'm definitely an optimist. I still see so much hope because of what Black women have been able to do. And, you know, somebody, I was doing an interview recently and someone asked me, and I should say it was a white man. I think this is important to, to, to say this point because he said something like, you know, is this, is this trial, is this finally going to be the moment that something changes? Like, he's like, I have so much hope that something's going to change at the end of this trial. And I said, you know, I'm not trying to sound like a pessimist by any means, but no, we're not relying on this trial to change things, unfortunately, because too many times it's been obvious to us what the answer should have been. But what gives me hope are my people because we don't stop fighting. So of course, George Floyd's life will make a difference to us. He always will matter to us. And we will continue to say his name as we will continue to say Breonna Taylor's name. But the system, like that's the part that needs to find its own way there's not much else that we can really do um, other than continue to connect it, I think, to to policy. I, I That's the forward way that I see. Well, I feel like that's why everything that happened in Georgia was so monumental. And then we look at, you know, you've given some great examples about the civil rights movement. When we look at the work of Ella Baker and so many of the, like, foremothers of the civil rights movement, they, they did the work in such a, like, a very... Um, in retrospect, very like systematic, practical way. It was like, okay, we're gonna register folks to vote and this is how we're gonna do it. And we're gonna continue to do it. Although we're being dehumanized and attacked, like we're not gonna like let go of our sense of optimism, of our hope, our resilience. And even as I was reading your book, I kept thinking of Wayward Lives by Sadia Hartman as like a companion to this, because it, it does go into the nuance and the, the beauty of everyday Blackness and especially Black womanhood and how expansive it can be and how it just has, again, the sense of like perseverance and resilience and hope. And hope is not this kind of only like kind of sky joyful thing. It is the sense of just like continuing to be consistent and per persevering in the face of so much heartbreak and tragedy. Like there is still hope for our people. And I don't know, I think I really do feel like it is like a calling from above because if you sit down and sit with everything that Black people have experienced, like how could you move forward? But we do so with such, with such beauty and joy, you know what I mean? And you capture that in the book. And again, if, if, if anyone hasn't read Wayward Lives by Sadia Hartman, pick up that book. It is life-changing. It is another like study of just like, it's, it's brilliant. But um, I um, I lost what I wanted to ask you. I, was, I, wanted, to, I wanted to talk about like your your research and how you put things together, but also I want Jamie to hop into. I, mean, I know you have so many questions about just like the organizing and curation of the chapters in the book too. Yeah, I, I think I I want to kind of tie in to what Anna has done to like the contemporary and also from a transnational perspective as well because. Years ago, I was able um, to interview Lucia McBath, who is Jordan Davis's mother. And that interview, and I, I used to abide by that very objective, like, I gotta keep myself together, I can't cry. But that was like one of my first interviews. I like, cry, like we both, like, she was crying and I started crying. I could not, I was like, I can't do this, right? And you uncover, like, you know, these, amazing historical black women who are these mothers of these giants that we revere in the black radical tradition. But I also think about um, someone like Emmett Till's mother, um, Mammy uh, Till Mobley. And I also think of the current mothers of the movement um, like Lucia McBath, 
like Samaria Rice, like, like, like all these women um, who, I think about Breonna Taylor's mother, George, like George, you mentioned it in the beginning of the book, George Floyd crying out for his mother, you know? And I wanna put this in a transnational context because this call to action, I hope somebody picks up like, and you put a, you make a, you're like a, the prototype for this, right? And I ho hope someone builds up on that to ask who was Maurice Bishop's mother? Who was Thomas Sankara's mother, right? And also too, like, there are several uh, black feminist anthropologists like Dr. Kristen A. Smith, who not only talk about um, anti-black violence in Brazil, but she looks to mothers in Brazil who've lost children um, um, in, uh, in, you know, with police violence, right? Anti-black uh, state violence. And one that comes in particular is a group called the Mothers of Akari, who uh, their, their sons were, were unfortunately murdered um, by state forces and no one wanted to um, you know, investigate, but it was the mothers that were constantly at the forefront trying to get information about their children. And when one of them did, they too were uh, felt or assassinated, right? And because they were trying to find these answers. And I think that we really do have to take your book and look at it, not just from a US uh, context, but also like a diasporic context, because this is happening uh, globally. And so I hope someone like ask these critical questions. Um, uh, who are these mothers of these so-called giants and why aren't they considered giants as well? So I, I really appreciate you doing this. Yeah, I love that point. I think it really reminds me of the pressure of how politicizing Black motherhood is. And whether we want it to be or not, there is this recognition of, I might be aware of myself as a Black person of how I'm treated, but that layer of when you care, and it's not only biological motherhood, it's when we are caring for our communities and we're caring for, these, for our loved ones, for our children, there's something so political about it. And Jennifer Nash is a scholar who actually says, you know, it's, it's, I mean, this is, I'm paraphrasing again, I always make it more inclusive, but, but it sucks that we have to always be political as Black mothers, but it's like a fight that can't end because these are our most precious beings and we can't stop fighting for them no matter if we wanted to take you know i mean there's definitely importance of talking about resting and you know like i often say we're part of something larger it's not all on my individual shoulders those are the things that allow me to say i also deserve joy i also deserve to relax i also deserve to rest but in the kind of larger scheme of life it's this fight that black mothers globally have had to fight and it really is not fair that we're, we're fighting that on our own. And I will say though, that I do think it's happening very slowly, like very slow progress on this, but there are some who are opening their eyes and I just want that to speed up. Like, let's get more people understanding the value of our lives. Um, so we're not fighting this alone, but there is something so political about black motherhood. So, motivating in a sense but it's also very terrifying so it's that balance between like you know I'll, I'll do anything and you know Alberta Burtis and Louise would do anything to just make sure that their children one knew what was going on in the world you know that's another unfortunate thing is that we have to educate our children on what's happening but it's also the balance of saying but you won't be defined by this and what will really happen is that you're going to join me in system changing work. And we can talk about the pressures of that. We can talk about the unfairness of that. But that's so much a part of, of Black parenthood, I would say. Yeah, most definitely. I do have one um, question that was uh, posed by Allison J. Um, and, and she wonders the same thing I wondered. Was it difficult to find the information on James Baldwin's mother because she's not she like we're, we're just not aware literally not aware of who she is except for when he brings her up in interviews like he'll say my mother says my mother believes she taught me to believe but we don't really know a lot about her so was it difficult to find information on her hers was the hardest to write for sure I mean in terms of all three and there not being enough information on the three of them that was definitely the case in all three cases um and i was on a panel recently with somebody who'd written a book about malcolm x and you know the question came up like how was the research like what did you have to go off of and he was like i was inundated you know by sources i, I had to really narrow down where i was going to go and bloody bloody i was on the complete opposite 
opposite end of that spectrum. For me, it was like, I, I needed to find anything I could possibly find. Thank God for a digital era where I can like, you know, control F and like search for mother, search for Louise, search for Burtis, et cetera. Because otherwise it would have taken me like literally 20 years to like sift through because it, there's so little about each of them in these books. It was like one sentence and I was like, oh yeah, I found it. That's so great. Um, <laughs> I would like move on to something else. But Burtis out of the three by far, was the least researched. Um, so with Alberta, I could go, I was able to, it was just really about finding the right person who could get me the folders on her because the King family and the Williams family have both kept, you know, at least enough about her. And if you go and visit the King Center in Atlanta, you'll be able to at least see photos of Alberta. Um, with Louise, there's only like two public photos that people are even aware of. So there's even a part of that erasure. And with Burtis, I think one is a result of the fact that Martin and Malcolm are more famous of the three. So a lot of people have asked me, why did you choose James Baldwin? Like, it feels like the two of them are more natural in terms of putting together. And like, well, how did you come up with Baldwin? Even though for me, I'm like, it made complete sense to me. Um, but he was less famous out of the three. So because I had to also start with the sons as my entry point, that already narrowed down a little bit like less um, in terms of options for Burtis. Um, and then on top of it, I think because uh, there's a lot of different reasons, but you know, she was born in a really tiny town. So even from the beginning, this city generally, or this, I would say, yeah, town is not well-researched to begin with. So I also had to really rely on if local historians or people who had just lived there for a long time could tell me history, because if you search Deal Island, there's not that much that comes up for Deal Island. So there's a lot of factors that contributed to that. Of course, because she was a member of the Great Migration, you also end up losing a lot of narrative when people leave. So one of the reasons Alberta is so well researched was because she was in Atlanta. There's so much about her and her family in Atlanta. And of course we know Atlanta is proud of their history. They keep it very you know, relevant. They keep it well documented. Um, if somebody moves away from that, it's a little harder to find. And those are many factors that contributed to it. But luckily, out of the three, I also spoke to the most loved ones of Burtis. They were the most willing to get on phone calls with me, whether they were brief or long. Sometimes they were only like five or 10 minutes, um, but I at least was able to fill in those blanks. And it was important to me to give the three women equal love throughout the book. Like I tried really hard, even in terms of sentences, numbers, and how many times I mentioned their names or the order in which I mentioned their names. All of that was really, really important to me. But definitely she's she is the one that I can say I, I am definitely the leading scholar in Bruce Baldwin. <laughs> I and definitely know the most. <laughs> and we'd love to see it. Thank I you. remember um I, when I got to see um if Bill Street could talk like at a premiere and Barry Jenkins was actually there. And he talked about how when he was writing the film, he actually hadn't had permission to use. The, the information yeah. yet. and he talks about how he had to write it like a letter like type a physical letter which he hadn't done he was like whatever to um james's sister who lives in gloria lived in right lived in france and he waited and waited and waited and she typed him back a, a letter that eventually says yes but it was like on a typewriter he was like that's how I knew like they, that she just was like, she was it. Like <laughs> she was the, the foremost authority. But I think about um, I, what, what brings to mind another point about uh, Burtis is that like, she was very much like, that's my son's business. That's not mine. <laughs> very yeah. much. Like that's my kid doing all that writing and talking and, and lofty thoughts and, and debating. That's not me. I taught him that stuff, but yeah. I'm gonna let him live and I think I think that's so beautiful but also very interesting because the other thing that comes to mind for me was was his struggle with his sexuality also a part of the reason mm -hmm. that we don't really have that connection between the two of them right like yeah. that's one of those big lofty questions that we'll never formally have the answer to but it was yeah. something that I was thinking about as you were just talking about your research process yeah I mean and it's so interesting because I think so the, the Baldwins and anybody who knew James Baldwin personally, they all knew how important Burtis was. That's like why Maya Angelou wrote even the smallest, you know, little bit. She would always mention Burtis if she talked about her brother, Jimmy. She would say, 
grant my mom Burtis, you know, I had to bend to half my height to kiss her on the forehead. So all these important people who James Baldwin was affiliated with, they all knew Burtis. Like their lives were so connected. He introduced everyone who mattered to him to her. He wanted to be buried by his mother. Like he was aware by the time he passed away differently than Malcolm and Martin. I think they knew their influence, but he was alive for longer and could see, you know, people care about my works and likely would know that people are going to try to come and visit his grave. And so for one of his desires to be, I want to be buried by my mom. I want there to be a plaque that says Baldwin in the middle, James in one side and Burtis in the other. Like that is so intentional. And he wanted the world to know her. Um, and I think that that that's crucial. So, and she was a writer. She just didn't have that same platform, that same opportunity. Um, so it, it's hard, I think, sometimes to know how much we might be casting on them just because of how we think about even gender roles that maybe they, I don't know if she believed that it was his thing to do or not. Um, I guess we, we will never know that. Yeah, um, so we are at um, here, my my time, central time, it is 6.57 p.m., which oh, means 7.57 no. p.m., which means it's almost time for us to go. No. This has been great. Anna, thank you you thank you thank you thank you for being here amazing book y'all if you have not gotten your own copy of three mothers please do so get multiple copies if you got it like that i got a digital copy from my <laughs> bag, and i got a physical copy from my house um we we thank you of course um JB from Black Women Radicals and Glory from Well Red Black Girls. Shout out to the Claudia Jones School of Political Education. Shout out to No Name, who was out floating in the ether, getting our headquarters space um, together for our community outreach that will happen in Los Angeles. Um, shout out to Michael, who is usually the facilitator for these meetings. I'm just usually behind the scenes. Mike decided to give me the opportunity to step up tonight. He was like, I'm a man. I'm going to be quiet. So thank <laughs> you so much for that. Um, I you were amazing, you. by the way. Let's just give it up for you. Thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Um, I really would be nothing without the community that I built physically in Philadelphia um, at No Name Books and digitally with all of you. So thank you again. We are each other's gardens. Okay. Um, uh ladies tell us what's next what's going on Anna we will let you go first uh next in life like what's happening in life okay yeah. <laughs> I, was like, I was like I know there's more to the event right there's still like, oh, like, like what, do we, what do we need to what do we need to be aware of what do we need to do how do we support you all of those good things Oh, uh, well, right now, for sure, please buy the book. Buy, buy, buy the book. Um, Obviously, it's been really, it's been a great journey and people are buying the book, but like, I would love to make it on some more bestseller lists so that people know these stories. That's like how we keep books alive. So let's keep that momentum up and um, buy it for friends and family and whoever, enemies, whoever you want to buy it for. Um, and yeah, there'll be more projects later. So I'm just grateful for kind of being a part of this family tonight. I feel really seriously so honored. I've done a lot of events on this book tour, but I hope it's okay to say this. This one meant the most to me. <laughs> so thank you for having me. And yeah, connect with me also on social media. I love hearing feedback. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for saying that. That just made my day. That just made the rest of my weekend. Um, Miss Glory, what you got going on, boo? Okay, so um, we're preparing for the Well Red Black Girl Festival in October. It's going to be October 26th. Um, and it's our five year anniversary. So that's, it's going to be a really big deal. So we're in the process of getting authors and everything together. And then we'd love you to come. We'll be in touch. <laughs> um, and we're looking for summer interns right now. So if you want to be part of the digital team for Lower Black Girl, please visit our Instagram page. There's a link in the bio where you can apply to be part of our team. We need social media interns and a graphic design intern. So please check us out. We read a book every month. Our April book is going to be called Baby with uh, Morgan by Morgan Jerkins. Um, yeah, hit us up on Instagram, social media, all that fun stuff. Thank you. Yes, and Morgan is fam. We hit, we read Morgan last year. Morgan is fam. Shout out to Morgan. Um, my good sis Jamie, what's good? Let us know what's going on. Oh my goodness. I like hate being put on the spot. My cheeks are like, okay, turning red. Um, okay, so 
Uh, Black Women Radicals, we have a fundraiser to uh, open a physical location for the School for Black Feminist Politics in Washington, DC. So that's the future goal. So if you could please support that fundraiser, that would be great. Next week, we're co-sponsoring an event, another amazing book, Mouths of Rain, um, uh, Anthology of Black Lesbian Thought by Brianna Simone Jones. And we're happy to be one of the co-sponsors for that event. So check that out. And yeah, just thank you for supporting Black Men Radicals. <laughs> That's all I'll say. <laughs> Yes, and of course, we at No Name Books have a long list of things that you need to be doing, all right? We got homework for y'all this month. For April, we are reading Kane by Jean Toomer, which is a Harlem Renaissance classic. You can find it on Spotify for free, the audiobook. I just found that out today from y'all telling us on Twitter, so shout out to y'all for being the plug. Um, it was picked by the incomparable, the one of the greatest comedians to ever do it, Mr. Paul E. Mooney, okay? It would make us and Mr. Mooney very happy if you took the opportunity to read that. We are also reading Charles Cobb Jr.'s That Nonviolent Stuff Would Get You Killed because we're that kind of book club, okay? We believe in the right to protect ourselves over here, all right? We are also, please don't forget, encourage the young person in your life to also read our youth, our young adult put, pick for the month. We are reading Everybody Looking by Candace Ilo, who is an amazing writer. It is written in verse. It's the most beautiful coming of age story I have ever read in my entire life. I think it's, I would honestly say it's gonna be next, for um like what's that other book skin i'm in or color the skin i'm in remember that book that was about the little black girl who had dark skin yeah it's up there with that one and color me dark if you know what i'm talking about if you was a kid nerd like me you know them two books by heart okay um also y'all the space is coming together merch is coming jamie yes please drop the fundraising link so i can put it in all of the things um Thank you for that reminder, Glory. Uh, Y'all, the Paul Robeson House is celebrating Paul Robeson's birthday. If you are in Philly, you know the Paul Robeson House is where we met. If you uh, have the opportunity, if as soon as they are open and you are vaccinated, don't be playing, okay? Open and vaccinated. Uh, please go visit. It is the house that Paul Robeson spent the last 10 years of his life. It's a really wonderful space. Um, they are family over there. It's great. Please go check it out. They're celebrating his birthday and they also have a fundraiser going on. So you know what I'm saying let's spread the love around. Let's keep the work going. Again, ladies, thank you for being here this evening. This has been great. I am Shakira with No Name Books and we say good night. Good night, everyone. Good night.